Hi there! You are currently watching the lecture on architecture and programming models for GPUs and coprocessors. We are in the 11th session and we are currently discussing rendering algorithms and we are in the middle of learning what ray tracing is. And last time we learned about what rays are, what paths are, and that rays carry radiance, so we learned a lot of, ter lot of terminology. And with all that terminology and those basic concepts, we're now able to formally formulate our first ray tracing algorithm. And the first ray tracing algorithm that we will discuss is the algorithm primary ray casting. And it is defined as follows. The algorithm primary ray casting is passed the exact same input that we would pass to the algorithm rasterization. And the algorithm then iterates over all pixels that make up the viewport. And for each of the pixels x, y, the algorithm generates a primary ray. And that uh, primary ray is, uh, like we discussed in the last session, a ray that originates behind the image plane, like usually where the uh, camera is located and uh, pierces through the uh, pixel x, y. So pierces the image plane at the uh, position x, y. So that gives us our ray that we will trace, our primary ray. And then we uh, also initialize a ray parameter, the ray parameter t, that is just associated with this uh, primary ray. Like the ray parameter t will tell us that uh, if there was an intersection, it will tell us um, the uh, distance from the ray's origin to the hit point. And initially, uh, we set that distance to infinity, and infinity will later always also uh, denote that the um, ray didn't hit anything. Like when we hit anything, then uh, that would be indicated by t being uh, smaller than infinity. And then we iterate over the triangles. And last time we learned that uh, ray tracing, like in contrast to, for instance, rasterization, can support like kind of arbitrary surfaces. Like every surface that you can uh, describe in a, in a parametric form, uh, you can, with uh, some effort, and sometimes even with very high effort, uh, you usually can uh, intersect a ray uh, with that surface and determine a ray surface intersection and uh, potentially also more than one ray surface intersections. And in this uh, very case, we're considering triangles as the primitive type. So as a matter of fact, uh, say we were uh, to support like other surfaces, like for instance, quadrics, like, um, like spheres or cones or cylinders or ellipsoids, and the ray could potentially have uh, two points of intersection with those uh, surfaces. And if the algorithm primary ray casting were only ever interested in the uh, very uh, first intersection, that is uh, the intersection that is closest to the ray origin. And this is actually the one uh, that the routine intersect will uh, later report. And the routine intersect is just uh, called for each and every triangle and reports a t, so the t um, uh, that, we, that we intersected the triangle with. And only if that t is smaller than our current t, like uh, if it, it is closer to the ray origin, then we update the, uh, the ray parameter t. And then in the end, we determine the hit point. And the hit point uh, is determined by just uh, plugging that t into the ray equation, like solving the ray equation uh, for the t that we just determined. Like we, you would usually have some special handling uh, for cases where the ray didn't hit anything. Like if the t was uh, still infinity, uh, then you would handle that specially. Uh, we could also imagine that it is handled uh, specially in that shade function that identifies that uh, that the hit point is invalid. Nevertheless, we then after we uh, we determined visibility uh, after after visibility was computed, we perform shading and we therefore uh, call a um, shading function like the shading function f from before that, that basically means that we are evaluating a local shading model so we're uh, computing uh, illumination from a uh, from for example a BRDF and we uh, add the contribution to the uh, to the current pixel color so the algorithm consists of multiple parts 
And the first part is primary rate generation. The second part is the intersect part, so to say, where we compute the closest hit. And this operation basically is the operation that is concerned with intersecting the ray against the scene geometry and computing visibility. And the uh, third part uh, is comprised of computing and evaluating that local shading model. So this is basically the shade part of the algorithm. So, and uh, with those ingredients, we can already analyze the runtime complexity of the algorithm primary ray casting. And we can just see that the worst case runtime of this algorithm is O of screen size, a viewport size, times the number of the vertices plus the number of the light sources. And that is actually relatively easy to see when we go back to the overview slide of the algorithm primary ray casting, where we see that the algorithm consists of a loop over all pixels. And inside that loop over all pixels, there is a nested loop over all the triangles. And that loop over all the triangles is followed by a loop over all the light sources. And as a matter of fact, the asymptotic runtime complexity that we see for the primary ray casting algorithm is actually the very same asymptotic runtime complexity that we also saw for the deferred shading algorithm. And intuitively, that actually makes sense because as a matter of fact, ray casting and ray tracing actually are uh, deferred in a sense that we first compute visibility and only after visibility was determined, uh, we actually perform lighting like which is the exact opposite of what we did with the uh, rasterization algorithm where we preemptively uh, shaded fragments uh, just in case so they could later be blended uh, because we uh, had some uh, semi-transparent geometry in the pipeline that would, uh, would uh, be in front of the, of the just shaded uh, fragments. So with the ray tracing algorithms, we um, basically defer uh, shading and lighting and as a consequence, the algorithm primary ray casting doesn't support semi-transparent geometry. So we also saw that the um, algorithm is basically organized into phases. And those two phases are commonly referred to by the ray tracing people as the intersect phase and the shade phase. And the intersect phase is concerned with computing visibility. That is, this is the phase where we determine the closest hit between the ray and the scene geometry. And the shade phase is concerned with computing a color for, for the potential hit point. Now with the very basic formulation that I presented so far, the algorithm is in all likelihood dominated by the intersect phase because this is a phase where we are um, dependent on both the number of pixels times the number of uh, input geometry of in input surfaces. And in all likelihood, this is uh, the, the, the input geometry uh, and the number of pixels are huge. So it is, it is quite likely that the algorithm is dominated by the intersect phase in the, in the very simplified uh, way that I'm presenting it here. And we will learn about optimizations to this very phase, to the intersect phase. And therefore, nowadays, it's a bit of a wash which of the two phases is dominating. And this depends on the scene complexity. This depends on the number of surfaces that we uh, consider in the first place. And it also depends on the complexity of the materials that we use. Like the intersect phase is mostly dominated by the number of surfaces and by the complexity of the intersection tests that we use. And shade is mostly dominated by the complexity of the material that we that we use uh, to determine the color. So and, uh, nevertheless, most ray tracing implementations are dominated by either of the two phases. And this pretty much depends on uh, the uh, context that we, are, uh, that we are in. Like for instance, many offline uh, renderers place a strong focus on uh, physically based and very complex materials. Like when we have like layered materials, uh, like, like car paint, for instance, where uh, rays are allowed to um, perform multiple bounces inside the material and where there's refraction inside the material. And then those materials are often quite complex and then the algorithm can be dominated by shade. And on the other hand, if we have some complex geometry, like some huge meshes when we're uh, rendering some scientific data, 
then the algorithm can also be dominated by intersect. And uh, therefore, um, when we later talk about uh, ray tracing algorithms, we will just uh, commonly refer to those phases as uh, intersect and shade. And what they uh, basically subsum is they are like um, collective names for determining visibility in the scene, like uh, computing closest hits with respect to the current ray, and then later determining a color that is associated with that hit. We will use those two names and refer to the two phases that are associated with them. And with all that knowledge, we can now um, consider a, a parallel formulation of the primary ray casting algorithm. And the parallel uh, um, formulation is actually pretty simple, like the most obvious approach to parallelize the uh, ray casting algorithm, the primary ray casting algorithm, is just to parallelize over the outer loop over all the pixels, right? And like when we assume we have like uh, millions of pixels, uh, then that also gives us enough parallelism so that the ray tracing pipeline here won't uh, starve in any way. So um, we have parallelism enough, and so it makes perfect sense to parallelize over this uh, over this outer loop over all the pixels. And this is actually what uh, people people do most of the times. There are other ways to parallelize the ray uh, casting and the ray tracing algorithms, but the most popular one uh, sees us parallelizing the algorithm over the outer loop over the pixels, and that's uh, what we'll at least will start with. And I mean, intuitively, the work complexity here uh, doesn't change much with regards uh, to uh, the work complexity of the serial algorithm, and therefore we just arrive at the same work complexity as the uh, runtime complexity of the serial algorithm, right? Like number of pixels times number of uh, input primitives plus number of light sources. And the uh, time complexity of the algorithm uh, reduces to number of primitives plus number of light sources uh, because we're basically factoring out the uh, number of pixels. We're basically uh, factoring out the screen size. So in contrast to the algorithm rasterization, uh, the primary ray casting algorithm can run an, on an ERW PRAM. So in regards to the right axis, this is uh, relatively clear because each ray processes in its, its own pixel. And then in the end, when the uh, pixel was processed, the right axis will perform to a unique pixel position that uh, only that uh, processor has access to. So the uh, exclusive right axis is relatively clear the fact that we're also using um, exclusive read access uh, sometimes raises questions here, and therefore I'll uh, quickly explain why this is so. So the question is, we have a shared input geometry and uh, shared cameras. Why aren't the uh, accesses uh, to those items synchronized? Well, uh, they are not synchronized because uh, those items are never written to, right? So and as they are never written to, uh, there's just no contention. So uh, we, we're basically only ever reading from those items and there's uh, therefore no, no potential contention that can happen. In our idealized model, and this is by far not what we would do in the real world, but in our idealized model, we could therefore just duplicate all the input data and replicate it on each processor. Uh, this is of course um, completely unrealistic uh, to do in a uh, in a real world setting, because we would like duplicate memory over and over again, so we would never do that. But um, we can just assume that we could do this, so it would be liable to just uh, replicate the data and that uh, that uh, each processor has its own copy of the input data. Like and because the input data never changes, there is also no need to synchronize those copies. And for those reasons, we can also use the exclusive read access model here and in addition to the exclusive right model. So with the primary rate casting algorithm in the way we're formulating it, and also with the extensions that we will later consider, uh, we are good with an ERW PRAM, which is in contrast to the algorithm rasterization, which uses Z buffer, a, a depth buffer, in order to determine visibility and therefore needed a CRCW PRAM. So if we were to render a, an image with the um, primary ray casting algorithm, like when we were only considering primary visibility, 
like with a very simple BODF and a very simple scene with a single point light source, the rendering would look something like this. The model that I'm showing here is the so-called Cornell box model. And the Cornell box model is a validation model for 3D rendering algorithms, like for physically realistic 3D rendering algorithms, where the researchers from Cornell University uh, actually built a miniature version of the of this box here, and provide uh, photographs of the of the box under certain lighting conditions, uh, so that you can compare your renderings with those photographs. And uh, this is what the outcome of the algorithm primary ray casting will look like. And as a matter of fact, if we were to render with either of the uh, of the other two algorithms, like with the algorithm rasterization or with the algorithm uh, rasterization deferred, we would uh, qualitatively end up at the same results. Like there are maybe differences um, in regards to like some 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 round of errors, etc like certain situations where the algorithms behave uh, slightly different in how they determine visibility and, and in regards to, to their exact uh, decisions uh, when it comes to a floating point accuracy. But uh, generally, our three algorithms should uh, provide the exact same results under the assumptions that we are making. Like the uh, assumptions are that we are only considering primary visibility in the very example, we don't have any semi-transparent geometry. We have only point light sources. We have very simple materials, like this is just a uh, diffuse Lombardian material that all of the three pipelines should be able to evaluate. And under those conditions, the outcome should be the same. And we are, we're, we're on the following, going to consider several extensions to the ray casting algorithm, to the primary ray casting algorithm, to increase the image fidelity. And while we're at it, uh, there's uh, one thing that we should briefly discuss. And what we should discuss is why uh, hardware vendors like NVIDIA or ATI traditionally implemented the rasterization algorithm in their hardware and not the primary ray casting algorithm. Like on the last slide, we already saw that the two algorithms qualitatively uh, give us the same results. Like, and then we also learned that the primary rate casting algorithm is actually superior to the rasterization algorithm. Like, the algorithm is deferred. Now, the question is, of course, is this desirable? Like, if we have a, a semi transparent geometry, it might not be desirable, but uh, say it is, then the algorithm is superior. And the algorithm also can make do with an ERE-W PRAM because there is no cont contention regarding memory accesses. So, and that really raises the question why the vendors didn't use the primary ray casting algorithm uh, to begin with. Like, what we can observe is that for 20 years, the dominant algorithm on GPUs is the rasterization algorithm. Like, uh, when the first GPUs came out, and even before that, when there were like graphics accelerators and uh, graphics workstations, the uh, dominant algorithm was the rasterization algorithm. And as a matter of fact, uh, ray tracing has always been considered uh, too slow and only rather recently was considered uh, viable for uh, real-time applications. And only a couple of years ago, NVIDIA started adding uh, dedicated uh, ships that can perform uh, ray tracing and hardware to their GPUs. But rasterization has, has always been out there and was always considered the best solution for real-time applications. and. Uh, this raises the question, why is this so? Uh, if, from what we learned, primary ray casting is superior in each and every way. So, and there's actually a couple of reasons that come to mind here. And the following is a relatively subjective list. And there are probably also uh, more reasons for why vendors would use uh, rasterization and not uh, ray tracing traditionally. And nevertheless, this is relatively subjective. So the first reason that comes to mind is just a uh, simplicity of instructions that are used with, uh, say, the vis visibility test uh, that we perform with rasterization. Like when we perform the visibility test with rasterization, we use the Pineda algorithm. And the Pineda algorithm is just a couple of very simple vector operations. And it's actually um, quite easy to conceive a implementation of the Pineda algorithm that uses fixed point arithmetic. And without going into the details, um, fixed point arithmetic versions of, say, a ray triangle intersection test 
are uh, way harder to uh, come by. Like uh, there are there's research out there that actually does that. Um, there are papers that describe how you can um, implement a ray triangle intersection with a fixed point arithmetic, but it's actually way harder to do, and uh, those algorithms are way harder to design than with the simple Pineda algorithm. So, and then uh, even if we, uh, if there was a conceivably easy to implement a fixed point version of the intersection test, then the algorithm would still uh, use uh, way more instructions. Like I already showed you the instructions that are necessary for the ray plane intersection, and we already sa saw that there's a conditional branch in there and uh, a, a floating point division. And as a matter of fact, the computations that are necessary to uh, intersect the ray with a triangle are actually a couple more. So there's just more instructions than the simple Pineda instructions that we that we use in order to to scan convert uh, triangles. So another argument that comes to mind is throughput. Like with the rasterization two algorithm, we already saw that if we find a um, clever way to uh, restructure the rasterization algorithm, we can parallelize over both the vertices and the fragments of pixels, and this is actually pretty powerful. Um, like with the design that I showed you earlier, where you had those uh, buffers in between the various stages. And uh, parallelism across those stages, uh, that's actually a very powerful design. And uh, this is a uh, design like those are actually um, also conceivable to obtain with ray tracing, uh, but it's actually a bit harder to do this. So, and then there is a third reason that comes to mind. And that reason is that with um, object order approaches, we can potentially just stop after processing and triangles. Right? And this is just not possible with a ray tracing pipeline, because with a ray tracing pipeline, each and every pixel independently tests the whole bunch of uh, triangles uh, for intersection. And therefore, uh, we cannot just stop short uh, when we, for instance, found out that uh, our uh, time budget is exhausted. Like, if we want to maintain a constant frame rate and in uh, real-time applications, this might actually be more important than displaying a correct result like a correct image, we could just with an object order approach um, decide to just not render a bunch of triangles. And this is just not possible in a, in a ray tracing pipeline. So those are just a, a couple of reasons why vendors might have decided that the rasterization algorithm is the uh, better uh, alternative to the uh, ray casting algorithm. And as a matter of fact, ray casting and ray tracing have long been considered just too compute intensive to implement in hardware. We will Later, also learn about certain optimizations to improve the runtime complexity of the intersect phase, like the phase that determines visibility. Like when we assume that there are such optimizations out there, we find that the primary ray casting algorithm can actually be quite competitive to rasterization, but it is important to note that those optimizations are actually quite complex. Like from a, a hardware perspective, the uh, optimizations that we will learn about uh, turn out to be quite complex. And that might also be a reason uh, for the popularity of the uh, rasterization algorithm, where there are certain optimizations like frost and culling, et cetera, but they are conceivably less complex than the optimizations that are necessary in order to accelerate ray tracing. So in, with all that theory, and uh, with all those considerations that we made, we will now gradually try and improve the image fidelity of the images that we generate with the ray casting and ray tracing algorithms. And therefore, we will um, step by step try to extend the ray casting, the primary ray casting algorithm, until we eventually arrive at something that we would call a photorealistic image. And the very first extension that we're going to discuss is uh, shadow computations with point light sources. And for that, we consider this uh, very simple scene here, like we have our virtual camera that is uh, located behind the image plane. And we have the image plane with pixels, and we'll, uh, we're will we able to sample those pixels and shoot a race through the pixels. And we're also giving this uh, simple scene here, like the simple scene is comprised of a single quad. And then there is a, another triangle and there's also a point light source. And what we learned earlier about the point light sources is that they are infinitesimal. That is, there is no area associated with the light sources, but the uh, point light sources are actually like an infinitesimal point in space. And they are characterized by that uh, light uh, is emitted 
with equal probability into all directions. Like there are actually uh, variants of point light sources, for instance, uh, spotlights that would uh, emit light into a preferential direction, but we will not consider those for the, for the moment, but we will consider we have a simple um, point light source that emits light equally in all directions and that is associated with a uh, position in 3D space. And we would then um, start with our algorithm primary ray casting, that is we would uh, sample our image plane with uh, primary rays and then we would use something that we uh, would call the closest hit operation, like um, the intersect phase of the algorithm would be implemented using an operation that we would call closest hit. Uh, closest hit in a sense that we uh, trace the ray through the scene geometry for the triangles and determine uh, which triangle is the one that is closest to the ray's origin. So we're interested in the geometry that is uh, closest to the ray origin. So when, when we found that, we would uh, start determining if the hit point that is associated with the, with the intersection is in shadow or if it is not in shadow. And therefore we would trace something that we would call a shadow ray or a shadow feeler, which is just a ray that originates at the uh, hit point and points towards the uh, point light source. So uh, for, for this uh, shadow ray, we would uh, find out uh, that we, we don't hit it, like we barely don't hit it, and therefore uh, the hit point is not in shadow. And then there would be other uh, hit points that are clearly in shadow, and therefore we would only uh, shade those points that are uh, not in shadow, where the light source is not obscured by any geometry. Uh, one thing that we should note here is that when we um, determine primary visibility, we use an operation that tries to find the closest intersection with any geometry, while in the case of shadow computation, we're actually good whenever we found any intersection with the scene geometry. Like when we found any intersection with the scene ge geometry, we know that the uh, hit point is in shadow, and then it doesn't really matter uh, which geometry we hit. Like we will later not process that information anymore. And using that, we will we are able to uh, compute uh, shadows. And uh, if you inspect those shadows, you will find out that they have those hard edges. And this is due to the fact that the point light sources uh, are infinitesimal, that they have no area associated with them. And then the decision if a hit point is in shadow is really just a binary decision, like we're either in, either in shadow or we're not, but there is nothing in between. And here's what an implementation of that would look like. Like the implementation here is an extension of our algorithm primary ray casting. And the algorithm is like exactly the same as the parallel version of that algorithm up until the point where we call shade. Like we perform uh, our intersect phase of the algorithm. And then we perform shade. And shade would be comprised of computing the hit point. Like this is the very first thing that we do. And then we iterate over all the light sources in order to find out uh, if the hit point would be shaded in regards to this, uh, to this uh, light source. And for that, we first uh, compute a, a uh, vector towards the light source. Like this uh, normalized vector here will be the direction vector of the shadow ray that we will construct next. And it's a uh, vector that points from the intersection point uh, towards the light source. And we would then initialize our shadow ray, which uh, points from the intersection point towards the light source. And only if that uh, shadow ray does not intersect anything, we shade the hit point with respect uh, to this light source. And we do this for all light sources, and then in the end, uh, we would um, end up with uh, something that would maybe look like uh, what we have here on the on the right image, right? Like where we have our Cornell box again, and in comparison to the image to the left here, we can now see that the uh, light source up here casts hard shadows onto onto the floor. I like what you can actually see is like the Light source here actually is a is an emissive geometry, like this model uses an emissive geometry, but I just uh, used the uh, center point of this quad as an imposter for the light source and traced uh, rays towards that. What you also can uh, see very nicely is that the geometry that is associated with the light source actually floats a bit uh, below the ceiling. And you can see this very nicely here when you inspect those hard shadows here around the around the quad. 
that makes up the the light source uh, the light source's geometry. And you can also see those uh, hard shadows here. And we already get some of the important depth cues in that the two boxes don't appear to be floating anymore. But still, like the uh, hard shadows, they don't, they don't really look like for realistic or very nice. They're just hard shadows. So hard shadows and shadow rays are arguably the simplest extension to the primary ray casting algorithm. And the next extension that we're going to discuss is uh, reflection. And we will start with perfect specular reflection. Perfect specular reflection means that we have a BRDF, a material shading function that follows a delta distribution. Like uh, when we discussed sampling earlier, we also discussed the direct delta function. And the perfect specular material uh, follows such a distribution that there is just, with just uh, given all possible directions that light could potentially be reflected in, like if we assume a, a diffuse model, then light can basically be reflected into any direction on the hemisphere above the hit point. And we're uh, now assuming that there is only one preferential direction, and that is the uh, direction of perfect specular reflection. And this is actually a very a very unrealistic model, and we will later also relax that assumption. But um, for the time being, we will assume that our reflections are perfectly specular and that the uh, material function follows a delta distribution, a direct delta distribution. And in order to evaluate shadows, uh, we have to make our uh, algorithm recursive. And we do this as follows. Like um, we have our function uh, that, that I now call ray tracing and not uh, ray casting or primary ray casting, which is not called ray tracing. But it's actually very similar to the primary ray casting algorithm in that it uh, receives the same input and that it has the, this outer loop that is parallelized and that goes over all the pixels. And we then first generate a primary ray again, and then we call this function trace. And the function trace will uh, actually perform the intersect operation and the shade operation. And the uh, shade operation here is now comprised of only a local shading model, like it was before with the uh, primary ray casting algorithm. We only evaluate a, sh a local shading model. And if and only if the uh, material uh, is a mirror, then we also trace a reflected ray. And therefore, we compute a reflected ray and we just recursively call trace. And that will again uh, intersect this ray with the whole scene geometry, like we will perform the closest hit operation again. And then we will shade that operation. And along the way, we will accumulate radians, like this is uh, not expressed here for simplicity, as I would have needed a second slide. But uh, we would just accumulate a radiance here and add it to the current, currently accumulated radiance. And what is important to note here is that the recursion is actually a tail recursion. So we could have uh, equally also expressed this uh, using a loop. But we don't because we're later going to extend the, the algorithm even more. But it's important to note that if we're only interested in our reflections, then the um, algorithm is actually only tail recursive. The images that we would generate with that would look something like uh, what we see here on the right side. Like in this image, uh, you can see perfect uh, specular reflections uh, in those two boxes. Like the uh, materials that are associated with the walls are still only diffuse materials, and therefore we use this uh, local shading model. And the two boxes are reflective, they are mirrors, and therefore we see both the floor uh, as well as uh, the boxes respectively um, being reflected. And as we now have this recursion, um, we also have to think of um, when to actually stop this recursion. Well, like this actually gets uh, pretty obvious uh, when we uh, consider the so-called uh, Hall of Mirror effect. Like here, I also made the left and the uh, right wall of the Cornell box reflective. Like there are also mirrors now. And I also chose a slightly different camera position. So I've uh, moved a bit into the box. And as you can see here, um, like we have this uh, endless reflection of the walls with each other. And that, of course, can become a problem because uh, this uh, can, uh, can eventually result in, in an infinite loop that we would, of course, uh, want to avoid. And there are a couple me of measures that we can take to avoid that, like uh, to eventually break the recursion. And this is usually done by either incorporating 
a uh, constant number of reflections that we only support. Like here in this very case, we just uh, support a recursion depth of five, and otherwise uh, we stop the recursion, right? And this uh, variable, this variable d, um, that is associated with the recursion depth, we just uh, pass to the trace function, and the trace function uh, will increment the recursion depth. And this recursion depth is something that we will later also refer to as bounces, as reflective bounces. So uh, one option here is to uh, restrict the number of ref of reflective bounces to a certain uh, to a certain upper bound, like five or whatever uh, uh, seems reasonable for the scene that we're currently rendering. And another option is, as we are accumulating radians and we have energy conservation, um, we will like uh, as, like like radians will gradually become smaller, like the accumulated radians uh, will gradually decrease. And after some point, we can just decide that the uh, radiance contribution that we have evaluated uh, is just not is just so small that it just doesn't contribute enough to warrant an additional bounce and then break. Like there are certain strategies um, where we would just uh, terminate the, that recursion. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, like when we're talking photorealistic ray tracing and if we're uh, talking algorithms like, for instance, path tracing that we will briefly discuss later, where uh, we actually perform Monte Carlo simulation in order to compute photorealistic images, it is quite problematic to have a constant factor where you break the recursion, because with that, you will lose energy. Like, um, this will basically break the assumption that energy is conserved. And energy conservation is actually an, a quite important uh, property of uh, photorealistic algorithms and therefore there are certain strategies that uh, people would uh, employ in conjunction with such constant upper bounds in order to mitigate the effects from energy conservation. Yeah, let us actually have a look at how one would implement this uh, function reflect here. Like the geometric setting that we're in is uh, we're given uh, two vectors, like the surface normal at the hit point, and we are given uh, one of the two vectors, like in this case the vector omega i, and they're both unit vectors, so it's important to remember. And the vector omega i uh, can actually uh, also be expressed as, a, as a, a simple linear combination of two other vectors, uh, namely this vector a here, and then uh, minus uh, this vector b, right? So uh, and with that, we can also express the vector omega o in terms of those two vectors a and b, right? because the vector omega o is just the, uh, the exact opposite, like the mirror direction of the vector omega i. And we therefore also know that omega o is just a plus b. So uh, that just uh, leaves us with the task of finding out what those two vectors are. And uh, uh, let us just uh, find out what the vector a is. And as a matter of fact, vector a is really just uh, the projection of the vector omega i onto n, like uh, the projection of uh, omega i onto the surface normal. And as we know from linear algebra, is that um, that uh, projecting one vector onto another is just done using the inner product. And we're also de dealing with uh, unit vector vectors here that uh, simplifies things. And therefore, we can just compute this vector a here as uh, as the vector n times the cosine of this angle of theta i here, right? And this gives us the projection of omega i onto, onto the surface normal. So um, we can also observe from symmetry that uh, those two angles here are the same, like the angle theta i is just the same angle as the angle theta o uh, between the surface normal and the vector omega o. And therefore we can also drop this subscript here. So in given a, uh, this basically uh, um, leaves us with uh, computing the vector b, and now we are we only this is this is actually the only unknown that we have left, and with a bit of uh, shifting terms around, it's actually pretty easy uh, to find out what b is. Like uh, this is b, it's just a minus omega o uh, omega i, and so if we uh, solve that and if we uh, plug in. Uh, the vector a here, we find that b is just that, right? And now that we have a and that we have b, we can just easily compute omega o, and we uh, finally find that omega o is just 2 times n times um, cosine of theta minus the vector omega i. 
So in here on this uh, slide and on the following one, uh, you can actually uh, find uh, the same derivation of the specular reflective uh, formula again, like with the uh, three vectors and the two angles. And then with the vector a and b, where we finally find out how to compute the uh, reflected direction omega o, given the uh, surface normal and the incoming light direction omega i and the, and the angle between the two. So here you also find all that on a, on a, on a single slide. And uh, while we are discussing those so-called delta phenomena, that is um, material models where light is uh, reflected in a single preferential direction, like the material basically modeling a delta distribution, it makes perfect sense to then also discuss a, a phenomenon that is called refraction. So an refraction is based on the assumption that light that comes from a direction omega i actually enters the medium. So when the light enters the medium, like it uh, will travel through that medium. And as a matter of fact, when the uh, light enters the medium, it will actually change direction. It will usually change direction, given that the so-called index of refraction of the two media, that is the media that we're coming from and the media that, we, that the light goes into, are different. So those eta's here, eta 1, eta 2, are the uh, index, indices of refraction of the two media. And the indices of refraction basically describe how fast the light can uh, move through this medium. Like the light speed through the medium uh, is proportional uh, to the index of refraction of the medium. And for a vacuum, the index of refraction just happens to be exactly one. And for uh, other medium, it usually is, 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 is uh, higher than one. In particular, for media where the light uh, is allowed to enter the medium, the uh, index of refraction is usually above one. And uh, those uh, media, or the objects that are associated with those media, we will uh, refer to as dielectrics. So the dielectrics allow uh, light to enter, and the direction changes uh, based on the index of refraction. And the change of direction uh, can be described by something that uh, is called the Snell's Law. And the uh, Snell's Law basically uh, states that the ratio between the sine of the angle between incoming and refracted light is uh, inversely proportional to the ratio between the two indices of refraction. Uh, like this ratio here sine of uh, theta i, which is the angle between the incoming light direction omega i, um, over sine of uh, theta o, that's the angle um, of the surface normal, of the inverted surface normal with the, um, with the outgoing light direction theta o, is uh, proportional to the index of refraction of the medium that we're entering over the index of refraction of the medium that we're coming from. So in the following, uh, we, we will, similarly to how we um, showed how to compute the refracted direction, like the um, direction vector omega o, given the surface novel and given the incoming light direction omega i, uh, similar to what we did for, for reflection, we're also going to derive the same thing for refraction. Like we, I will show you how to compute, uh, given those two vectors, how to compute the uh, vector omega o. And also, given the two indices of refraction, we'll make some simplifying assumptions for the moment. And we will make the assumption that eta 2, so the index of refraction of the medium that we're entering, is always bigger than eta 1. And we will also make the simplifying assumption that eta 1 is just 1. That is, the medium uh, where the light is coming from is actually vacuum. And that will uh, simplify a, a bunch of things. And I'd say, let's just have a look how to compute uh, this uh, refracted direction omega o. And uh, when we understand how to compute that refracted direction omega o, we are actually going to extend our algorithm, our ray tracing algorithm, to also support that phenomenon. So when we're in a similar geometric setting uh, as we were before, like we're given our surface normal n, and we're given the incoming light direction omega i, and what we're after is the uh, refracted direction omega o. 
right? And then we also know that the that we have our two refractive indices, uh, which I didn't, uh, which 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 I'm not showing here, but uh, the refractive index that is associated with the uh, medium that we're coming from is uh, the um, is is eta one, and in our case uh, we agreed that it is just one, because we're coming from a vacuum, and the uh, second refractive index that that of the medium that we're entering is eta two and is uh, greater than one for our assumption. So and similarly to um, what we had before, like when we discussed reflection, we can uh, again uh, define helper vectors like uh, this vector a here. And uh, then we also we also have this vector b. And like uh, here for refraction, I'm actually uh, switching signs. Uh, like th this is not a big deal actually, but simplifies things a bit for me in terms of in terms of the equations that I will write down later, like when I uh, derived reflection, I actually um, used b with a minus sign here, and now I'll um, use b with a plus sign. Like um, we'll uh, have the linear combination that omega i is just a plus b and not a minus b as we as we before. It's really not a big deal, only uh, for the sake of the of of the argument here and for simplifying things a bit. But uh, what we now don't have is uh, that symmetry from before. Like um, before, we had that symmetry where we just knew that the um, vector omega o would just be a minus b instead of a plus b. Like, and this was actually a very, very simple relationship. And we don't have that simple relationship uh, anymore. And uh, therefore, we also need to deal with different helper vectors. Right? So we'll have another vector, another helper vector uh, that is called uh, c. And then there's this uh, second helper vector that I will call d. Right? And there is a relationship between the various vectors, but uh, the relationships aren't just, just as simple as they were before uh, when we discussed reflection. So, but as a matter of fact, like there are a couple of things that we uh, know about the relationships between the, t between the various helper vectors. And in particular, what we know from Snell's law is like when we, when we do a bit of trigonometry, we'll uh, just find out that uh, the lengths of those two vectors are related. So we know that the length of the vector d is eta i over eta 2 times the length of vector b. And um, we know that from Snell's law and doing a bit of trigonometry, uh, we can, that, can find out that out uh, relatively easily. So we know that, and the other thing that we actually also know, like we get, can actually see that uh, from the, we can see that graphically, like from on, like in the image, it's uh, quite obvious that the uh, two vectors are pointing in opposite directions, right? And therefore, we can express the vector d in terms of the vector b, uh, given Snell's law and given the two refractive indices. And this is good. So um, with that, we already know our first vector d. So as the vector d depends on our vector b, uh, we have to just plug in our vector b, and the vector b is known. Like it's, this is the very same trick that we did before, where we projected omega i onto the surface normal, and then uh, then uh, computed this linear combination uh, in terms of omega i. And so it's relatively easy to uh, find out uh, the vector b, like similarly to what we did before. And so we can just plug in the vector b here. And with that, we have our first ingredient, actually. So we have our vector d. So now that we know the vector d, um, let us try to find out uh, what the vector c is, actually. And therefore, um, let me, I, I just made some room, like I minified this uh, illustration a bit. And this is still our vector d. And we're now interested in our vector c. And the first thing that we can see is that the vector d is um, just uh, proportional to minus the surface normal, so the surface normal pointing into the medium that we're entering, times the cosine of this angle theta o here. Like this is the very same trick with the dot product that we did before, where we just projected the uh, vector omega o onto the surface normal. Only that the surface normal is now inverted because we're pointing into the uh, medium. And we're also, we're, we're now not using omega i, but we're using omega o. And the problem here is, of course, that we don't know omega o, right? And therefore, we also don't know theta o. So this is, of course, obviously a problem. So we have to work around this somehow, So because this is what we're going to find out. But we, what we know so far is that our vector c is proportional to that. And uh, maybe we can work with this. 
So and the first thing um, that we can do is we can reformulate things a bit. I like uh, this is basically still the same thing, only that the that that I have this uh, this square root term here now. Like here's the, the, here's the here's the surface normal here's the minus sign. So we basically just replace that uh, cosine uh, theta o term here, and uh, this is just this is just a a bit of reformulation. Like um, like I just used this uh, trigonometric identity here. And replaced the cosine term with this uh, square root term here, right? So I mean, this is perfectly valid. I can do this, and I mean, it's uh, still problematic that this term uh, still depends on the vector of theta o. So this is something that we, we that we want to do something about, right? Um, so we still have this problem, and I only reformulated things a bit. But um, we know a little bit about the uh, sine of theta o. From Snell's law, like if we remember Snell's law, and and if we switch terms a little bit, we can actually determine what sine uh, squared of theta o is, and we can even express it in uh, terms of theta i, and this is what we're after, right? Because theta i is known, because theta i is just the angle of the surface normal in this vector omega i that we that we know. So, and due to Snell's law, we can express this sine term here, the sine squared term here under the square root and I can just replace it accordingly. Like when we like when we really uh, later um, formulate this uh, this algorithm in terms of uh, trigonometric uh, functions, it is worthwhile uh, to do so using uh, cosines instead of sines uh, just for the reason that those cosines can be replaced with uh, dot products. Like apart from the square here, um, the a cosine of uh, theta i is just a dot product uh, between uh, this unit vector uh, here and that ve unit vector, which is just the surface normal. And uh, therefore, it's worthwhile uh, to reformulate things a bit in terms of cosines instead of sines, and then we can just plug it in uh, to the term here under the square root, and that gives us our vector c. So now we uh, know our the, the whole vector c, like uh, as the square root term here times the uh, surface normal, and with that uh, we have all the ingredients that we need to compute our vector omega o in terms of uh, variables that we know, like in terms of the surface normal, in terms of our two adas, like the two refractive indices, and in terms of the angle theta i, which is just the angle between the surface normal and the known vector omega i. And with that we are done, and can implement that in C or in C++ if we want to. And we of course also have service slides for refraction where we uh, can comprehend the whole thing without the handwriting. Like um, here is again an illustration of those helper vectors and of the various relationships, like the relationships that follow from uh, Snell's law, and also the relationships that just uh, fo follow from geometrical observations and the various uh, transformations that we applied to the equations and uh, we therefore find out the very same thing that we find out in the in the derivation that I showed you earlier. So you can just comprehend it uh, on those on those slides. So and with refraction there's actually something uh, that's a bit special about refraction and that is so-called uh, total internal reflection. So total internal reflection can only happen in the uh, case where we assumed that it that 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 it doesn't happen in our case, like in the case um, where we are coming from a medium with a higher um, refractive index uh, than the medium that we are entering, so uh, that means that eta one is greater than uh, eta two. So, for instance, when we're for example uh, going from water into a vacuum or from water into uh, into air. And uh, total internal reflection mathematically just happens uh, when this uh, term under the square, square root goes below zero. So when that happens, like uh, there, there's uh, no solution in the real numbers to this equation. And in physics, what happens then, like in the case of total internal reflection, is that the light uh, gets reflected instead. And uh, let's just see what uh, that means geometrically. And here's what's happening geometrically when we have uh, total internal reflection. 
And note that the setup has changed a bit now. Like the medium that we're coming from is now actually the medium here down here below. And we're just having a uh, refractive index eta one of uh, 1.3, which is higher than the um, refractive index of the medium, medium that we're going into, which in our case, we just have say uh, being a vacuum and thus the refractive index is one. So our light is now coming uh, from down below here and we're interested in that uh, in that uh, refracted direction. And this is our refracted direction. And we are now changing this angle here. Like we are, uh, we are playing a bit with this angle, with this angle between the surface normal and the vector omega i here. And we can see that at some point, like when we adapted the the angle enough, uh, that uh, the vector omega o will graze. And uh, this is when the term under the square root will actually approach zero. And then at some point, it'll actually uh, not graze anymore, but the uh, term under the square root will become negative. And then we just substitute that with reflection. So this is what happens, uh, what, what happens geometrically. Like in uh, that case, where the vector doesn't graze anymore, but would actually, uh, the square root term actually becomes negative. We instead use the uh, reflected direction, like the perfect specular reflect direction for the uh, omega O vector. And on a very minor side note, uh, this uh, principle of total internal reflection is also the uh, governing principle of optical fibers. Like when we're using optical fibers to pass uh, data through those cables, like um, what we're making use of uh, basically is total internal reflection, right? We have our light beam here, and then we um, make sure that the light beam enters the uh, optical fiber at, at, a cr at the critical angle. And then uh, total internal reflection just helps us to uh, pass the, the light beam uh, through, the, through the optical fiber. Huh? And this is also the reason why we shouldn't bend those cables too much. But this is all actually really only on a very minor side note and not important for our, for our lecture here. But should illustrate that this uh, physical principle actually also has its uh, practical implications. And in fact, total internal reflection is the reason why when we're like, for instance, diving or when we're underwater, uh, that we uh, cannot see what is above the water surface. So and this is what our refraction looks like. Um, like uh, we, uh, we uh, see refraction here underneath the water surface, like we see how the uh, light that is reflected uh, from that uh, sphere here is uh, refracted before it is scattered towards the viewing direction. Uh, we also see a, an, a very typical effect of, uh, of refraction and this is uh, those caustics like this, uh, those light bundles here which are uh, quite typical for refraction. And, and with all this, all this theory uh, we're now able to extend the uh, recursive algorithm from before, like the tail recursive algorithm from before, we can extend it to also support refraction. And this uh, gives us the original algorithm, uh, the original algorithm that uh, people refer to as ray tracing. And this is the algorithm that was uh, first proposed by Turner Witted in 1980 at SIGGRAPH. And uh, he uh, proposed an algorithm where uh, we have the same uh, setup that we had before, the same uh, recursive setup where we generate primary rays and then uh, call this function trace. Like we would call the function trace, then we would call intersect and shade, and then we would have some special handling for either um, perfect mirrors or for dielectrics. And for a perfect mirror, we already saw in the tail recursive case, what happens. And for dielectrics, uh, that is materials where uh, light can be refracted into, uh, we have a uh, special handling and we actually trace two rays because uh, dielectrics usually have that property that they are uh, partially reflective and partially refractive. And therefore, um, with those, this type of material, we uh, trace two rays and the first ray is just reflected off of the surface, like we uh, did in the, in the reflective case and the uh, other ray is refracted into the material. Uh, and uh, this is basically done in the, very in the very way that I just described with the two functions reflect and refract. And uh, this function is not tail recursive anymore. And 
and uh, therefore we uh, get something that 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 people call a ray tree. Huh? So whenever we have a uh, surface interaction, like then we have depending on uh, what the uh, surface actually is, if it is a dielectric or if it is a mirror or if it is an, like an arbitrary like diffuse surface, we perform different action. And like when the uh, surface is, uh, is is reflective or if the surface is refractive, uh, then we generate uh, those additional uh, ref refractive and reflective rays, right? And each of those rays starts what, what, what people call a bounce, right? And uh, because we have this, uh, this uh, recursion type where we have uh, different materials uh, that result in uh, different types of rays, this actually um, results in a tree. Uh, while when we, if we had only, only a reflection, like uh, if this was only the uh, tail recursive uh, case, then we would actually not have, not have a tree, but we would have a list. Like we would have a reflection, and then maybe another reflection, another reflection, another reflection for each of those bounces. And uh, with the uh, rated ray tracing algorithm, what can actually happen is that we have um, refraction, and then we also have reflection because we are we are uh, dealing with a dielectric, and therefore we uh, we get those those uh, binary trees where, where we have a branching factor of two instead of one. And from those considerations, we can also like already guess the uh, complexity of the weighted ray tracing algorithm, like the work that is done per bounce is actually the same work that we, that we did for the uh, algorithm primary rate casting, right? Like what happens per bounce is basically just um, primary rate casting. And then we kind of assume that those reflect and, and refract functions are O of one operations, uh, which, is, uh, which is a valid assumption to make. And therefore, the algorithm will then asymptotically be, lim be limited by what happens in this in this in this ray tree. So, and based on those considerations, we can derive the complexity of the weighted ray tracing algorithm. And we see that uh, the weighted ray tracing algorithm is obviously an extension to the algorithm primary ray casting. And therefore, um, the complexity, the work complexity of the algorithm is obviously proportional to the work complexity of the primary ray casting algorithm, like uh, this term in the parenthesis here, is just the complexity of the uh, primary ray casting algorithm. So that kind of makes sense because we're just recursively uh, calling that algorithm over and over again. And we are calling it, well, we are calling it as often as there are uh, nodes in the ray tree, right? Whenever there's a uh, node in the ray tree, we're, uh, we're uh, presented with a ray surface interaction, and therefore we have to uh, call uh, those functions. And uh, therefore, the work complexity is just proportional to the work complexity of the algorithm primary ray casting times the number of nodes in the ray tree, that is, in the biggest ray tree um, of all pixels that we consider, right? As we have a ray tree for for each and every pixel, and there are, there will be some ray trees which will be um, uh, which will which will be, uh, will be tiny, like for instance uh, when we hit nothing, like when we just uh, hit the background when the ray misses, then the the, the ray tree will consist of, of not even a root node. On the other hand, if there are like multiple bounces in the tree, um, the tree can become uh, quite complex. And uh, therefore, the work complexity is proportional and limited by the ray tree uh, that has the that has the, uh, the highest number of nodes. And that actually has a number of serious implications for us. And the um, most serious implications actually are that we're like we're not proportional to the height of the ray tree. But we're actually proportional to the actual number of nodes. Like we have to really uh, visit each and every node in order to uh, fully render our image, and that means regardless of if the uh, tree gets deeper or if the uh, tree gets wider, we're always presented with more work, right? So, and um, given the work complexity of the algorithm, it's actually quite easy uh, to see what the time complexity is because we're actually uh, doing the very same parallelization for this algorithm that we also did for the primary ray casting algorithm. So we're basically just uh, having this uh, parallel loop over the, uh, over the number of pixels, over the screen size, and uh, in the limit, the, uh, uh, the uh, whole screen can be rendered in a uh, single time step because uh, we are assuming that we have an infinite number of uh, processors available. So the time complexity uh, can just be derived from that. 
Yeah, so that uh, was basically our algorithm uh, weighted ray tracing, like as an extension to the algorithm that we saw before that only supported uh, reflections. One thing that I should note is that the original uh, formulation of Witted, and I actually, I, to be honest, I omitted it uh, for simplicity here from this slide. The original formulation by Witted also included shadows, like we, all, we discussed shadows earlier, and the uh, formulation by Witted would also include shadows. And um, in particular, it would uh, include reflection, and it would also uh, include refraction. And therefore, it would basically uh, be comprised of so-called delta phenomena, right? Like a phenomena where the uh, material that we are evaluating or that the, where the light source that we are evaluating um, follows a delta distribution, a direct delta distribution. Like the uh, point light sources were infinitesimal and therefore uh, there was a, only one uh, direction that we could uh, uh, trace our shadow rays in uh, in order to evaluate the light source. And uh, that was like the gist of the widget ray tracing algorithm as, an, uh, as a uh, combined algorithm of the various phenomena like uh, reflection, refraction, and uh, shadows with uh, delta, with direct delta distributions um, in order to evaluate the phenomena. And this is what many people just call the ray tracing algorithm. Our discussion about those effects like ray trees and uh, hall of mirror effects and uh, multiple bounces, they actually also illustrate nicely where we uh, care so much about worst case complexity and not, for instance, about average case complexity. Like, consider we're in a setting where we trace a bunch of rays, and most of those rays are like actually finished very soon. Like, they only perform very little bounces. And then there's only like a single pixel or a handful of pixels, and uh, for those handful of pixels, uh, we have uh, ray trees that are very deep, huh? like uh, where uh, this O of log H, so uh, where, the, where the height of the ray tree like uh, factors in uh, quite a lot. And then uh, those uh, very few pixels, like the one, two, three, four, five pixels that have a, a very deep ray tree, will actually uh, block the uh, whole algorithm because we cannot finish uh, rendering the image before those those handful of pixels were processed too and this of course is a problem right because uh, this handful of pixel actually determines the uh, time to image and this is the reason why we worry so much about worst case complexity like in the case that i just sketched the average uh, case complexity would potentially be rather low right so in order to achieve like uh, constant frame rates and in order to in achieve uh, low latency and in interactive frame rates in graphics, we worry a lot about worst case complexity and contrast to like average case complexity or uh, similar metrics. So what we also saw with the weighted ray tracing algorithm is that it was a was a like a partial extension to the primary ray casting algorithm. Like we're now handling reflection, but we are handling ver like a very particular uh, case of reflection. Like we are only handling this uh, very case where we have um, perfect mirror reflection. Like for instance, um, if we have diffuse uh, reflection where the uh, incoming light directions are distributed differently, we're just not handling this case, but instead just uh, computing a local shading model. And this is, of course, uh, quite a bit of an approximation. And in our next session, we will learn how to relax that, actually. And uh, we will uh, talk about, about a couple more extensions to the ray casting algorithm and to the widget ray tracing algorithm, actually. And those extensions uh, help us to achieve more realism. And at the same time, uh, they require us to uh, trace more rays. And uh, it can actually be observed that when we increase realism, that we usually have to trace quite a lot of more rays, and which can of course be, become problematic. And therefore, uh, when we talk about uh, how we can increase uh, realism and how we can increase uh, image fidelity, we, as a consequence, also have to talk about how, how to improve performance. So our uh, next session will be comprised of more realism, and as a consequence of that, it will also be concerned with uh, improving the efficiency of the ray tracing algorithm. And this will be the topic of our next session.